North Carolina school kids have finished up the first quarter of the school year, some 100% virtual, some a hybrid of virtual and in-person learning. The question now is what comes next for the kids, for the teachers, for the faculty, for the parents? Well, Dr. Terry Stoops is the John Locke Foundation's Vice President for Research, also the Director of Education Studies. He's been looking at this question, writing that parents should really be alarmed by some of the decisions that are continuing to keep their kids out of the classroom. He joins us now with a look at why. Terry, welcome back. Thank you. Give us your your sense of the science and the health risk when it comes to kids and COVID-19. The health risk is really minimal to kids and the staff that work in public schools so long as they take reasonable measures to ensure that uh, they have a a clean environment in their schools. I mean, we we have seen, uh, for example, schools that have been in person uh, that have initiated in-person learning for months now have uh, very few cases of COVID-19, no fatalities, uh, and have been able to manage the in-person classroom, the adjustment to in-person classroom in the age of COVID without uh, without any risk to the students or the staff. And, and, and so, you know, we, we as we learn more about COVID-19, I think we understand that schools aren't the super spreaders that everyone thought they would be this summer and that it really is safe for kids to go back into the classroom. In fact, you write in your new piece that uh, folks can read at johnlock.org that People should be very concerned if their kids aren't either back in school in the classroom or moving rapidly towards that. Tell us why. Yeah, well, we're fortunate that more schools, more public schools in particular, are starting to move back into in-person instruction, uh, even though that there's around a quarter that are still insisting on having remote learning for the remainder of the calendar year and sometimes even beyond. But the learning loss that's produced uh, the longer that the students stay out is really what I focus on in this piece. Uh, students who are participating in remote learning plans learn less than they would in an in-person environment. Uh, There's a tremendous amount of research that backs up the fact that a remote learning plan is inferior to in-person instruction and therefore there is learning that's lost in between them. So if you think about the fact that students started remote learning in March and some continue uh, in remote learning environments through the beginning of the start of the school year, that's a tremendous amount of time and a tremendous amount of loss in what they could have learned had they been in the classroom. And there are long-term fiscal and economic uh, implications for that learning loss. What does it mean for those kids if they're simply not learning because the environment just can't support what they need? Education is cumulative. So the further they fall behind, the fewer skills they're able to acquire. The fewer skills that they're able to acquire uh, means that they'll have a more difficult time getting through school and may drop out, therefore depriving them of a necessary credential, or they'll go into the workforce with the minimal amount of skills and not be successful. And this will have a significant effect on their earnings. There was one estimate that a student, if they fall further enough behind, Uh, will lose up to a year's worth of salary through their lifetime if they have to endure continued learning loss due to COVID-19's remote learning push. So this is the real concern is that students, especially those that can ill afford it, these are mostly low income and and, uh, minority students, uh, that that have this level of learning loss can have significant uh, uh, be a significant detriment throughout their career. That's so fascinating because in your paper that we're talking about right now, available at johnlock.org, it's really the first time that I have read some in in depth depth analysis of the long-term implications. We're so focused on right now, what does it mean for how do you uh, take care of your kids when they're learning in the home, etc. But you're talking about a lifetime of implications here. Terry, is there any way to avoid this or to make up the ground that's been lost? Well, the first step is to get these kids back into the classroom and as much as possible resume the typical type of in-person instruction that uh, really benefits these kids. Uh, the, The ways that we make up for these learning losses will mean that we have to radically rethink 
the way that we provide education, especially to low income and ethnic and racial minority students, is that we may need to add time to the school year and the school day. We might have to institute some uh, intensive tutoring and take other measures uh, to ensure that these students catch up. And uh, this is not really something that our system is very good at, of being able to adjust uh, to a different environment and providing supplemental services for students who need them the most. And that's why uh, I think that there are ways that we can provide these services using school choice uh, uh, mechanisms, such as uh, ESAs or vouchers, to provide these supplemental services to, to children, uh, something that other states are actively exploring right now. Essentially, the money following the child and then the parents can decide what that child needs and that's going to be different from from child to child absolutely and and we know we will know what the student needs once we start getting back into standardized testing because uh, another disturbing part of this whole story is that we don't know how far behind students are because we suspended testing at the end of last year and we don't have active state testing going on right now and we may not, depending on the outcome of, of the elections, have, sta have a standardized testing required for the current school year. So we don't really have a very good sense of where our students stand, but I think there's a, a great deal of expectation in the research uh, that, that's been done tries to model the, the learning loss, the expectation that students can be anywhere between um, a, a half a year behind to more than a year behind in school. And uh, it just gets worse the longer they're out of school. Terry, we've been talking about the North Carolina public school system here. How are private schools handling this? Are they facing the same challenges and, and following the same course? It varies, of course, from private school to private school, but there are some private schools that have been in in-person learning since uh, late summer, uh, Thales Academies in uh, North Carolina, a chain of private schools, has been uh, conducting in-person instruction since July. I know that the Catholic Diocese uh, of, of North Carolina, the two dioceses, are uh, conducting in-person instruction in many of their schools and they're doing social distancing and, and hand sanitizer and masks. And there have been uh, no evidence that uh, these schools are perpetuating or spreading uh, COVID-19, uh, even if there are, a, a, you know, a regular number of students in the classroom or, or a typical uh, class size. There's no evidence that it's being any, that there's any harm to the students or the teachers. So uh, we know what private schools are doing. We have evidence that they're doing uh, in-person instruction successfully and that there are very few clusters associated with in-person instruction. And yet the difference in policy and procedure and activities between the private schools you've described and the North Carolina public schools is stark. Why? Well, the private schools don't have to listen to the governor. <laughs> and uh, the public schools do. And so the governor is uh, basically creating a, a situation where school districts are waiting on him to decide what they can and can't do. Private schools don't have to do that. And I think they've really benefited from not being restricted by the governor's executive orders and being able to make the best decisions for the kids in those schools.